Okay, so welcome to another episode of Extra Bites, and uh, we are now live on uh, YouTube as well. Um, so today we have one wonderful uh, photographer from Germany. So he's Karl T. Laval. So uh, hi, hi, Karl, and um, welcome to this uh, episode and. Thank you for accepting our invite to be on the panel. My pleasure. Yeah. If I, have, if I have to give some brief introduction about him. So he is a self-taught landscape photographer. So he's living in Germany. So, um, and interestingly that his passion for photography started after he moved from US to Europe. And uh, when he started photographing the beauty around him, uh, just to share with his family and friends. Uh, and that is amazing. And um, uh, he says that he's a pretty boring guy and he will try and figure it out. And probably after this, he. Um, and interestingly, that his passion for photography started after he moved. Uh, probably. Somebody uh, is uh, on the YouTube, please switch it off. Okay. So um, I'm sure that after this, he will have a different opinion about himself. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of adventure going in. The, to these locations and the creative aspects behind it. So he loves capturing them. So um, welcome, uh, Carl. I have something to share with you. Uh, probably, let me... Okay, so guys, we have... Before before I ask my first question, uh, let me welcome you, Carl, all, uh, all over again. And we have our panelists in, um, in the name of uh, Prakash. Um, Kumar Singh from Dubai, then we have Madri, then we have Sandeep Mathur and Somroy. So, uh, Carl, my first question to you is, um, I'm going uh, I'm going to share something and uh, we were trying to find your profile picture and it's something to do with that. So, I have something to share. Let me just share that first now. All right. Okay. So, uh, just a minute. Just hold on a minute. Okay. 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 So. Do you see it? No. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, does everybody see it? I see it. Okay. So now we could find this. Oh, yeah. I okay. love this photo. Now, after that, we could find this. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if okay. picture is it is the horse or, or you. So. <laughs> then we found this. <laughs> then we found this. Amazing. Thank you. Then we found this. This is the only place where... Um, but but I, my question will come a little later. So anyways, let us first figure it out. Then this. Look at wonderful profile picture. <laughs> then look at this. This. Look at this. This is amazing. <laughs> Here. Camera. This one. Okay. Then this. Amazing stuff. Thank you. Then this. This also the face is hidden. Covered. <laughs> This okay. <laughs> so my my question to you is, um, uh, there are only a couple of places where we could see your face, and that that is where you were with your friends. Yeah. And only one place where we could see your face very clearly, and that is when you were with your tripod in your hand. Okay. Do your friends bribe you to 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 show your face? Or, or you need some company to show your face. They pretty much sneak the photos. I don't realize I'm being photographed and right at the right time they get the shot. I mean, when 
they try to say, hey, let's take a photo. And they take a photo of me. I hate it. I end up looking like one of the trolls from Iceland in the, the photo. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're that camera shy. Yeah, I don't know when it started, but I started to get really camera shy. I feel very comfortable behind the camera, but in front of it, uh, yeah, it makes me <laughs> a little bit nervous. The best profile photo was like, <laughs> my girlfriend Renata, she took that photo from me and she kept bugging me for a photo so I just put my hand up and kept it there and she was trying to wait till I took it down to get a clear shot and it happened <laughs> okay very but very interesting because um, uh, I know that photographers landscape photographers particularly are very shy of getting their images clicked but but still at least one profile picture but there's none so that's amazing anyways <laughs> So, um, so Carl, take us through your, um, um, tell us something about how did you get into photography because America itself has a, a lot of uh, photography opportunities, landscapes, uh, photography opportunities, but how did you decide to um, get interested in photography and landscape photography once you started, once you moved to Germany or Europe, you so to say? Oh, what is that? Yeah, I came over here and I started taking photos with cell phones. Because, you know, where I come from, I come from Michigan and from a small town, you don't see castles every day and amazing European architecture. And that's where I first started was more with the architecture here and castles. And I was taking photos with cell phone. <clears throat> a friend of mine, he was in the photography at the time. And I started seeing a lot of his photos that he was posting on Facebook. I asked him, hey, what are you doing? How do you do that? And he explained to me about the, yeah, about a good camera and Lightroom. So I went out, bought my first camera. I think it was the Canon 600D. and started taking photos of castles just to show back home on my Facebook page to friends and family. <clears throat> After that, it turned more into a love of being outside and outdoors, which I always had because I come from a very small town and from the woods pretty much. And I reconnected with that feeling of yeah, being outside as a kid that kind of started going more towards the landscape aspect. All right, all right. So, um, but when did it start um, turning into your um, photography as a passion or something? So when did, when did it happen? When did it start? It started when I was just out at Castle North, Neuschwanstein, it's one of Germany's famous castles. I was there just shooting the castles. And for some reason, it clicked on me that night because I stayed there in a snowstorm to get shots of this castle covered in snow. And I don't know what happened, but that really pushed me to, yeah, push for more in myself and going out in nature and trying to share my passion with others. And that's a hard question to, to explain, but... For some reason, this kind of happened for me like that. All right, all right. So, can't really wait to dig into your for this story, your journey into photography, and uh, how did you really uh, progress through photography in terms of landscape, and then and uh, take us through the, your journey as a photographer, and and maybe share some images as well. Okay, should I share my screen with you guys now? Or, yeah, go ahead. So, so uh, when did you start? Uh, you know, which year did you start shooting? I started shooting in 2015, oh, and so I got really yeah, addicted by the end of 2015, 2016. Okay. Your progress so quickly, Carl. Uh, yeah. it's work. Thank you so much. Um, it means a lot. But yeah, I started in 2015, 2016, like I said, with more with castles, something I call castle scapes. And then uh, towards the end of 2015, 2016, I moved more with landscape photographies. Also, my first trip, I believe, to Iceland was in January 2016. 
And that just exploded for me in my head that I have to do this just landscape. And that was like a big turning point for me, seeing the, the beauty of this land. And then all of a sudden the cattle and the cityscapes didn't have quite the same impact on me. And you travel with your family quite a lot as well, right, Carl? Um, not always alone. Yeah, I travel with my family um, a few times in Iceland. They're also uh, big nature lovers, love to get out. And we meet up in Iceland. It's actually cheaper to meet up in Iceland than to fly back home to the States. So it works out for both of us. Your parents are still in Michigan? Yes, they live in Michigan, yeah. Nashville, Michigan, uh, small town, maybe about 800 people. Yeah, wow. Yeah. yeah. We have more than that in my apartment. <laughs> you guys have a very dense population there, no? Really? Okay. Yeah. But yeah, um, this photo here, I got this from Tenerifa. It's one of my favorites. This plant was taller than me. Yes. What's that? No, no, I'm just exclaiming. Okay. Yeah, this plant was a lot taller than me. I think it's um, called Red Buglos. This was on top of the El Taida National Park. I seen this from a distance and it was a couple of hours before sunset. And I'd seen a couple of people walking around the area earlier. So I decided to go out there and stand with my tripod for hours waiting for the sunset to make sure nobody trampled over the plant. And yeah, I got a great shot, I think. I had a lot of fun feeding the lizards cookies while I was waiting for my shot. So I just sat down <laughs> on one of these big stones with dishing out the cookies to the lizards. Help time pass by. This flower hmm. was on the rock, uh, God, this. Yeah, it was, it was growing out from these rocks. I mean, this is volcano rock. They look like they would be really heavy, but they're very light. So it's very hard to actually walk across this type of landscape because the rocks are turning underneath your feet and they're pretty big. But somehow this one managed to push up through the rocks. And like I said, it was a little bit taller than me. And wow. I got, yeah, I got lucky with that one. So you went really high to ca capture this on your tripod? Yeah, my tripod was fully extended and pushed down on an angle a little bit. So okay. I had plant and the volcano peak in the background and focus. It's impossible to make out the scale of this. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. A lot of people uh, asked me about how big that was. And I have some cell phone shots. I have to post them on my Facebook page later. And you guys can see me standing next to this plant with my tripod. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Oh. There's also another one of my new favorites. This is from Norway. Yeah, we love this. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this is when I was there last summer with Ole Hendrik. And that was a phenomenal trip. It was less than a week, but I've never gotten one trip so many keepers. He brought me to all these places. And I mean, I thought I loved Iceland. I, Norway blew me away. So uh, did, did you guys do like a road trip for seven days? Yeah, a little, yeah, I think it was six days, and maybe seven days. And it was a road trip. We went to Ramsdalen, um, Jokotan. Sorry, Ola Hendrik, if I'm slaughtering the, the names of these places. Yeah. And to another place, a name that I can't even fathom to pronounce. Trin, right? Trin. Uh, or I don't know how you pronounce that. You've got quite a few shots from there as well. Screen, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and we have uh, Hans Gunnar Aslatsen coming this Friday. So if you want to clarify your pronunciations, you can stick on till Friday. I have to check that <laughs> out. He's a great photographer, great guy. Yes, 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 yes. So um, tell us a little bit more about this picture, you know, like the, the background, the mood that you create. I mean, I see... Uh, Carl Laval picture, and I know it's yours. I mean, I see a picture, and I know you created it because so much. such a distinctive mood and the dodge and burn that you use, it's, I think, is now quite famous, 
right? Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, oh, it's quite a bit of warping with this shot, and it was very. It's two shots. It was one for the foreground, the waterfall, and then one where I zoomed in for the the mountain in the back. We had a really moody. I believe this was afternoon. We didn't have to wait for sunset or anything. It was really dark, moody. It rained and it stopped raining. And this mountain looked so sinister to me. And I think this is one of the first shots, the first few shots that I took on our trip. And then I just wanted to create that dramatic look. So yeah, I went kind of black with the rocks, a little darker, and tried to work in a lot of atmosphere on the shot because there was a lot of atmosphere, but sometimes it gets lost when taking a longer exposure or things like that. So I try to bring that back into my, into my work. How about the glow of the mountain? Did you uh, dodge that portion or that? What's that again, Sam? Uh, uh, the glow around the mountain, the white light around the mountain. Yeah, I, I kind of brung the, the light back out of it. I darkened it up and then brung the light back. Okay. Get more contrast, more of a pop. I mean, it was, it was stormy weather and the light was off to the right side. So I wanted to bring that back into the shot. Um, uh, this is almost a monochromatic image. Um, uh, and if it weren't for these brown uh, grass uh, uh, behind the waterfall, uh, we would, I mean, this could just pass off as a monochromatic image. Did you uh, accentuate that brown deliberately or were you tempted to move yeah. to black and white at all for this? Yeah, I accentuated that brown. It was more of a, a lighter orange and I wanted it to be a little more dark. So I accentuated it and kind of, yeah, pushed the, the highlights down in the plants that were there around. I didn't want it to be too sidetracking from the main waterfall and the mountain peak in the background. Um, I took a lot of color out from around the rocks and I think I used uh, color effects and painted that a little bit black just to give okay. this drama. Not something that I always do, but I felt it worked on this. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. I think uh, there was a question on YouTube by uh, Dr. Uh, Palami Raman. He's asking you, Carl, if, you, if, if the clouds existed in this state or you, because you know you created the shape through uh, the light painting or the dodging yes the clouds pretty much were in the shape i mean i warped this up a little bit kind of pushed it together make it more uh, dynamic but the clouds were like that they were really low hanging dark yeah moody storm clouds we had some great light that day not great light within sunset or sunrise colors but storm light and that's one of my favorites. Yeah, mine too. Mine too. I think this this uh, became one of the most popular pictures on uh, One X, right? Recently. Yeah, I think it did pretty well. Yeah, I was surprised. No, I think it's due. I think it's due, Carl. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. So let's see what I got here. I tend to lately, and I don't like so much um. Sunset colors. I like more, yeah, blue hour shots. Shots like this. I mean, everyone knows this shot or this place. I like to work more with only a few colors in my color palette lately. And I'm really a big fan of blues. And as you see here, I got this was one exposure I took in Iceland while waiting for the, the northern lights that never happened that night. And now this is, this is one wonderful shot because we've seen a lot of uh, winter shots from this place, but um, none like these, uh, this one, but this is amazing. So is this uh, kind of focal length blend or uh, single shot? It's single shot. Or, no, it's a focus stack. I focus for the foreground and I focus on the mountain. And I think I was at maybe uh, anywhere from 15 millimeters to 18 millimeters. And I was just down on the ground on the ice. And I was actually holding my tripod because it was so windy 
and the ice was just blowing across us. I tried to capture it, but yeah, from the long exposure, it kind of faded away the, the blowing snow and lines. Stunning. This is absolutely stunning. Thank you so much. And how much how much post would have been gone into this image? Post? Post production. Yeah, spent a few hours on this one. Um it came out looking great in the camera because this was one of the few times that I actually used the Kelvin temperature on my camera. And I got the color. Normally I'm in auto, auto color. And I got the, the color dead on. So then I just wanted to work in the light from the moon that was off to the side and I accentuated the light coming in on the peaks of the mountains where the light actually was. Great. Amazing. So I, I have a good story to share with all of you. And uh, Carl, I don't know if you remember this, but when you uh, uploaded this picture, it came with a very nice message that you hate tagging the location, yes. uh, right? Yes. And uh, I think it was last year and that had a profound impact on me because some of these locations, obviously everybody knows this is Vestra Horn, but with a lot of other locations, we kind of give them away, right? Through one single Facebook post and then it becomes a domino effect. Yes. Uh, so, and that's something, you know, like I try to do at least something which is not on your face. People don't know. I've tried my best to not tag the location. And I think that practice is now gaining momentum everywhere. A lot of people have stopped tagging the location. So, yep. uh, how did it come across? Uh, you know, come, come across your mind that this is something that you should do. Yeah, after I was there, I mean, I I found some trash along the shoreline that people, the tourists, had left behind, and it really got me thinking about, you know, we as photographers were sharing these images and with hashtag in these locations. I mean, years and years ago, no one was shooting this mountain. And now it's like Disneyland at certain times of the year with so many tourists. And I think it's really important that we protect the nature and protect these pristine places before putting a tag on them. Because we only got one earth. And I'm not saying that everybody goes to these places and leaves behind trash, but the more people that visit, the more yeah, destruction is done to the natural landscape. So I've been tending not to put any types of tags and I've been trying to do new shots, new locations that are not overshot, like obviously that's drawing. Right. Totally agree with you, Carl, on this. Like even I have been guilty of creating a domino effect. So it was like four or five years back, but those okay. places are gone, totally destroyed because so many people move in and they are not responsible travelers or tourists. Like they yeah. littered a place, they uh, destroyed the plants. And even some of the photographers in the process of getting a good shot, they cut off uh, branches or they chop off uh, like uh, segments of trees just to get a beautiful image through the foliage and all. So it's terrible. Yep, I understand completely what you mean. Yep, that's what... That's what really got me is just seeing the, the way nature was mistreated by the tourists, stuff being left behind, like you said, to get the shot, breaking branches or manipulating the nature just for an Instagram post. And yeah, I find it disturbing. And that's why I stopped putting the hashtag exactly where the places were. So... Yeah. Yeah, I, the other question I had, Carl, again, like looking at the depth of some of your complex shots, right? Uh, I, I saw some of your intimate shots uh, where you have been able to separate some of the branches with the backlit or even, you know, the lot of light that I think you have created yourself. It's, it's incredible. Even, you know, some shots like that, the one, yeah. So how, how did you scale up on your Photoshop? Skills. What's um, been the journey? Up. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm a big tutorial junkie. I got a lot of tutorials from you know 
my favorite photographers and I learned a lot and then incorporated my own style into it. Because when I first started out, I mean, I already deleted these photos many, many years ago. It's absolutely horrible. HDR, photomatics. Yeah. But then learning a lot, um, yeah, I just kind of developed my own style from the tutorials and four shots, four scenes are very hard to shoot, very hard to process. But when you get one right, I mean, I, I enjoy this shot. I like, I like the fog. I'm a big atmosphere guy. The more fog, the better. And yeah, this one just kind of happened. I was actually waiting for another shot at a river bend and it was too foggy. I couldn't see the river. I just went into the woods and started shooting. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, the, the color separation, uh, I mean, look, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, you know, like the one on the right, uh, the branches, I don't know if you have any leaves over there, I can't see it, but to selectively just grade the ones on the left, I think, you know, even in post-processing, it's not easy. It's not easy. Easy. I mean, on the right side here, there was no, there was no leaves. This was on, um, I think, in April, and everything was just blooming. I'm not sure what kind of trees these were, but I just seen that from distance. I mean, I think I shot this at maybe 100 millimeter or so, and it turned out really nice. I like that. Um, another example: my passion for fog and in the woods, and I just wanted to separate from the fog and the pine trees, this yeah, dying plant over here in the bush. It just kind of stood out in my eyes while hiking through the woods here. Uh, Kai, do you edit those leaves um, separately or they are there like that? How, how are they? Because I find um, editing jungles and all very complicated. <laughs> 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 Did I pick them, did you say? No, I was saying that me and Prakash were discussing the same topic before this session. In that, you know, uh, dealing with forest scenes where you've got a lot of elements yeah. need, needs a lot of patience. It needs a lot of patience. It's really hard to be in the forest scene and find something that works. I, for me, I, I find it a lot easier to shoot forest when you have fog, when you got some atmosphere going on, because then it kind of dulls the entire shot and you can focus on just one thing like this bush that had the leaves when everything else had already lost them for the winter. And there was like leading line here of a path and the light was coming from behind. I think this was early morning. And that's what I try to go for is I try to make it more simple, keep it as simple as possible. And fog is a great help for that with four shots. Get rid of this chaotic look of everything yeah brilliant yeah thank nice. you yeah brilliant absolutely thank you guys oh do you sell prints carl or it just no, i haven't sold any prints no nope. wow I mean, do you do you choose to remain you know under the wraps you know the secretive guy who likes pursuing the passion <laughs> Not, I don't choose to. Um, yeah, I don't know why I haven't done more. I, I, I would love to be a full time photographer, that's my dream. Okay. That's my passion. I think I need to do more, maybe sell some prints. And I was thinking about maybe making a couple of tutorial videos and put them on my website and just see how it goes. That was going to be my question uh, What route are you going to take? Selling prints or uh, doing tutorials, or both, for that matter. I think I'm more interested in doing tutorials. I think uh, I can speak for the six of us. We will sign up immediately. The okay. moment you announce that, we will sign up. Awesome, guys. Yeah, I would love to see <laughs> how this jungle thing works. <laughs> <laughs> I will definitely get on that and start making, making a uh, couple of tutorials, maybe forest scenes and mountain scenes. and yeah. start, so, with, start with forests. Start with forest? We'll do. Then, yes. then, then move on to the blues. <laughs> we'll do. <laughs> and probably well, we'll on, on how not to tag locations. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let me see if I have any more forest shots. No, I only put those couple in here. 
Oh, um, yeah. another thing I really like besides but, the blues is the greens. Carl, I think uh, forest scenes are one of the most complicated, especially if you do not have the right atmosphere and when you have to create it to isolate uh, the elements, it's incredibly tough. It's, it's very difficult. There's too much chaos going on. Sometimes, I mean, there's guys out there that can nail it without having atmosphere or anything like that. Like Alex Noriega, I mean, these guys, they work magic. For me, I like the atmosphere. It makes it easier. This is also in Norway, where? This is in Iceland. This is Iceland, okay. Yeah, I took that on January, 2019. And this is an unknown location. I was just staying there in a, a hut with my friend. We were out shooting and this started happening in the evening. Ran out, started shooting. What you see here, the thing that kind of looks like a frozen fox or a horse, it's not that big. I had my camera direct up to this thing. And this water, this ice, I was actually standing in it, pretty much hip deep. I didn't realize that I was gonna break through it because it was pretty dark. And then I seen that and I, I just stood with it. I stayed in the water. It's pretty cold. <laughs> January, January, we need to go there. It's 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 like the fox is guarding the yeah, yeah. lights, guarding the mountains and the light. <laughs> yeah, I thought funny. it looked like a dolphin. Dolphin, yeah. Dolphin? Some people say it looks like a horse. I've heard a fox. I see a fox. I see a fox. <laughs> see fox, okay. Yeah, I like the greens also. I like um it was awesome from that trip. I love shooting the northern lights. It's very hard. You gotta have a lot of patience. But it's definitely worth it. it. Definitely pays off when you get a good composition, a good shot, and something something different. You have in in almost all your um almost any, any nightscape that you are creating, whether it is with the uh, uh, Aurora or it is uh, that Vesterhorn, mm -hmm. there is at least one star which is shining, right? That's my, my personal touch I like to do. Yeah. <laughs> one star is a little brighter than the rest of them and make it a little brighter, put a couple of uh, lines through it to really emphasize that. And uh, how many shots uh, typically you take, Carl, for something like this? This shot? Oh, God, I shot this. It was probably about 100 different frames. Wow. Uh, and the final output, is it um, is a time blend? Is it a time blend, this shot? Yeah, maybe within an hour of a time blend. I got the landscape here. It was dark but I still had some great light. I think it was at um, F2.8, ISO 1600, and I got the land. And then I didn't move camera and just kept shooting. And I got tons of different yeah, sky shots. And this one turned out the best. I really liked how it looked and put that one in there. It looks fabulous. The composition is a standout. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think you're a natural, uh, Carl, uh, even like uh, we could just hand over a camera to you and you would shoot the right composition. I think it's just something which yeah. just... Oh, thanks so much. Not not always, you know. I feel so. Like in five years, if you could produce these, then I think it's just part of it. Okay, I, I, I have a question for you here because uh, since Soom asked something very interesting, um, do you feel uh, that before you really moved to Europe and started clicking images and then uh, you got hooked on to that. Before that, did you ever feel the urge of picking up the camera and trying to create some image? Um, um, number one question. Then second is, do you, do you feel that um, creativity comes naturally to you when you are out in the field? Or you still have to uh, struggle hard and strive hard to, to visualize something? How does it work for you? So... First question, um, when I was in the States, I mean, yeah. yeah, I had a lot of fun playing around with the compact cameras all the time. And I was always taking photos, but it was never, not like it is now, but I always, I love photography back then. I love taking photos with just the compact cameras. 
back in the day. So I always had that passion for, yeah, photography and art, and that was always in me. Um, the second question, when I go out, yeah, the creativity, it comes to me pretty quick. If I'm in a location, I do a lot of scouting and I kind of like turn off my mind to think I have to go out and get a great photo. I have to go out and get this composition. I just kind of check things out and then I find something. And it's, it's pretty easy. I kind of get in this, I don't know, a flow. For me, the processing sometimes comes harder than actually getting the shot. All right, all right, just and 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 do you uh, now since you coming from your last part of the answer that when you are there in front of the scene, so do you visualize what kind of processing will go into it, and and do you visualize your final outcome of the image? Yeah, of course. I mean, not all the time, but I'd say probably about ninety percent of the time, I visualize what I want and I try to set up my composition for that. Here, I've seen the stream going through here and there was a lake back here. And I wanted those lights to get bright enough that it would reflect a little bit off of that. And that was in my mind the entire time. I got the nice reflections in post. I brought them out, popped them out just a little bit more, but they were there. And that, for an example like that, that's, I got what I wanted that night. I don't always get what I want. Sometimes I get a shot and I don't even really like it till I get home. And then I play with it in uh, post-processing and I think, wow, if I push this to a little more blue and go with colder tones, this really works. It comes and goes in different ways that I process the photo. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and another very interesting aspect in this particular image, which I see is that um, you have uh, really put a lot of emphasis on the foreground and the midground. Whereas when we look at Aurora images, uh, people uh, are actually uh, too much intimidated, including me, uh, too much intimidated by the Aurora itself. And uh, we tend to include more of Aurora. Uh, we want to show people more of Aurora, um, not just the glimpse of it. But here you have a very, very balanced and very wonderful composition. So what is, uh, um, what is your thought process on this? Do you, when, when the aurora happens in front of you, uh, don't you also get carried away and you also want to shoot more of aurora or? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, first trip in Iceland in 2016, it's an amazing aurora. I came back with only photos of the sky. I was just blown away by it. I was only shooting the sky and maybe a little tip of the mountain you could see. And but my second trip around, then I wanted to really do something different for myself, a little more challenging, incorporate more of a, the land into the shot and make it not only about the aurora, but also about the land. And I like it a lot. Um, snowy scenes, it's a lot easier to shoot aurora because you get a lot of reflection off the snow. So you can concentrate more on your foregrounds and your middle ground because you have more light and you can see it a lot more with the eye and the camera picks that up amazingly. So you don't have to worry about taking a super long exposure for the foreground or shooting the foreground hours before the aurora happens and blending them in time. Fantastic answer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. I think Carl, one more question again for Dr. Uh, Palani Raman. He you know, joins us. Uh, for every session that we have conducted so far. <laughs> so uh, one of his questions is, did you, now this composition again, and pretty much everything, right? The stream leading you into, and then taking a bend into the mountain, the mountain being dodged enough to capture my, uh, my, my attention, and then all the way leading up to the Aurora, right? So it's, it's so amazingly structured, the whole sequence. Now, did you like do you think analytically when you arrive at a location that this is the best composition or is it just the artist in you which intuitively knows that this would be the this would be the right composition uh, yeah it's a hard one um yeah when i approach a scene i if i like something i think it's going to work i i'll stick with it i mean it, it comes to me pretty quick when i 
I'll play around with a couple of different angles from a composition and find the shot or the angle that works the best. And yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I don't go out with us most of the time. I don't go out with a specific idea. I like to go hiking and exploring areas. And then when something catches my eye, I work with it and go with it. I'm going. But I have a lot of failed attempts, trust me. <laughs> you guys only see what I, I'm wanting you to show you, so I have a lot of failed attempts. <laughs> Maybe show us some of those debacles, Carl. I don't, I don't load them up on here, so not this time. <laughs> hey, that, that, this image is great, man. It's, Thanks, man. Uh, this is where you, uh, where you survived the mosquitoes. The mosquitoes? Which one? Um, yeah, this one, right? This one? Yeah, the mosquitoes in Norway. I thought everything was bigger in America. No, no, no. The mosquitoes in Norway are huge. They're like flying birds. <laughs> yeah, I was there with uh, Ole Hendrik, and he brought me to this magical place. This is um, a... Is it, wow. uh, what was the name of the waterfall? I can't remember the name of it. It's yeah, a, one of my favorites from that trip. Now I also did here a focal length blend. Here was, I believe, 15 millimeters around these rocks up until this point. And then I think I went with 30 millimeter and took the, the mountains in the background in the sky because they look so tiny when you shoot with a wide, wide angle with the compression on it. So this is how it actually looked to the eye. Okay. Oh. Um, yep. I really, really like this one. This is one of my favorite. Because it's dark. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> uh, you, uh, you like the dark shots you were telling me. <laughs> not, not, uh, now, I, I have another question here. Uh, not exactly to you, but uh, since you are here, so we've been seeing a lot of photographers um, resorting to focal length blends. Nothing wrong in it. Personally, I, I, I don't find anything wrong in it. Now, my, my question is something totally different that, um, and, and most of the photographers have started, they said that they, they just learned on their own and all. I have still intrigue in my mind that how is it possible that you pick up photography and, and throw some light on that. You pick up photography and you grow very fast. Um, you say that you are also uh, mostly a self learned photographer and self-taught photographer. You might have had your inspirations along the way. But all of a sudden, because focal length blend is something complicated. It is, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, it is far more complicated than focus stacking. And then, then how is it, how does it come to you as an individual initially during the course of your journey through photography that suddenly today, now I will do um, Focal and blend, and I'll learn also, and I'll master it also. Um, is it that is it is it that easy, or a lot of hard work goes into it? Um, focal length blend is a it's a lot of hard work. Um, I didn't do it at first, and I don't over exaggerate with my focal length blends. I try to keep it the way that it looked with my eye. I mean, when you were to see this shot without the thirty millimeter mountains in the background, these mountains are just tiny. And when you stand exactly where I was standing, they looked this size to the eye. So I wanted to keep it more accurate. Um, yeah, the focal length lens, I don't do them all the time, but it is hard. But when you have leading lines around here, yeah, and it's very easy to blend in. When you shoot the shot right, you shoot for the, the wide angle, then you a second later, you take the 30 millimeter shot, the light's the exact same. It's pretty easy to blend in, I find. But there's some complicated ones. If you have trees or bushes in the background, you try to do a focal length blend. This is very complicated in my eyes. And I'm all for it. I mean, a lot of guys are doing a lot of stuff. I, I watched the um, interview with Joshua Chanel and I think he said he had 15 millimeter and then 120 for the mountains. That was awesome. Much respect. We have we have hands on uh, um, on YouTube. Hands on YouTube. 
Yeah. <laughs> Carl's image is from and and else. I don't know how to how to how to pronounce that. So if you can help me in Norway, super short buddy. <laughs> Aldasness. Aldasness. Which one? No, Hans is saying this image is short at Atlasness. Ah, that's the name of it. Okay, thanks, Hans. <laughs> <laughs> Big help. It was so many different names, and I couldn't pronounce anything in Norwegian. I tried my hardest. I thought learning German was hard enough. <laughs> I heard that language, and wow. Did, did you did you know German before you moved in, or you learned it there? I had to learn it here. It was very very hard. I couldn't speak a single word of German. My first sentence was, uh, can I have a beer? I learned that one pretty quick. Ugh. But then I had to go to school here for about a year and then learn German. Very complicated language. Yeah. yeah here's another one from Norway. Wow. And it went also very dark and dramatic. I kind of like it. It has this 3D effect almost that you led up to the mountain yeah. through the rocks. And... and this is the one with the crown. Yep, this is the crown. Yeah, this was awesome. This was, I didn't add any of this in process, post process, nothing. This light was going on and this clouds around the peak and it really caught my eye. And I shot that. This is uh, also a focal length blend. Oh. Um, so. Another one from my trip to Norway. I've got a lot of favorites that last July there. I really like the reflections. I was originally shooting. Where is it? This shot, I was downstream of this waterfall when Ole Henrik yelled to me to get my ass up there and look at this amazing light. And then we got that shot this night. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. And that was from the same location downstream. I, yeah, I like this one. This is amazing because there is bright light out there in the sky and, and almost fairy orange and but the image is yet moody and, and uh, it has dark tones to it and that's amazing, I think. No, thank you. Um, no, what, what I see uh, which surprises me, uh, Carl, here is that you don't have any of that um, uh, yellow cast on the water. Did you deliberately remove that or... Um, I mean, yeah. I would expect some yellow cast on the water as well. In an image like this, uh, yellow cast here you can see on the rocks. The water was very blue water. Um, okay. Rivers and waterfalls in Norway it was set so pure, clean water. It's very blue, like something you see in Iceland. The yeah. colors is rivers. So I actually desaturated the water. This was very, okay. very blue. Okay. Um, this is also, this is me actually standing in one position when turning around in the exact same spot this was a little bit later i got that shot wow that's from wow. the exact same spot just behind me where we were at it was just every direction that you you turn you had a different composition mountains rivers lakes this was shot around i think midnight now uh, um Carl, just tell me these these um, until unless you are in Norway uh, and, and unless you know uh, the places in Norway like uh, Hans does and he's he's pointing it out. It's very difficult to figure out. There's no stamp of Norway on these images. They are stunning landscape images, no doubt. But uh, so you are talking about here landscapes in particular, and you are not talking about shooting iconic locations. So, uh, so um, am I right on that? Yeah, that's something I, I really love that you had the chance. I'm, I didn't find these places. Ole Hendrik, all things go out to this man for bringing me to these amazing locations, but they're unknown. There's so many of them and 
without knowing where these places are, I would never find them on my own. I would have no idea that exists. And it was landscape paradise. I mean, just walk in new compositions, unshot mountains, lakes, streams, tons of mosquitoes and elk poop everywhere, but totally worth it. That's fun. And, and uh, how much hiking and all uh, is required to reach these spots and all, whatever you've been showing? This one, where we were at, we didn't, maybe hiked about half hour. There was an old road. He told me that the construction workers that went from one side of the fjord to the other had built, and we used this old construction road and drove as far as we could and then hiked to the places. Mm. Hey, Carl. Uh, so now the, you have so many shots from the night. One of the biggest challenges, at least because there's no Aurora over here. I'm, and uh, I think this was uh, probably, you know, end of the year. That's why you still have a little bit of like, you know, the 24 hour light in the sky pretty much. Yeah. But one of the challenges I personally have is you can't really see the feedback on the camera, how you shot this even long exposures in dark, right? So uh, do you transfer it to your phone or uh, how do you normally validate if the image is actually good? I shoot multiple shots and I take multiple, um, yeah, focus points. And, I mean, this, yeah, this was, um, this shot for an example, this was still bright outside. I could see it, it was at midnight but this was in the July, so there was still kind of like this midnight sun type in the year. But for an example, when you have a really extreme aurora like this or one like this, you can see this with your eye. And when you take a shot with ISO 1600, 2.8, you're gonna see this in the back of your camera when you have so much light going on. Um, yeah, same, same with that shot. I mean, you could see everything and when, I think the foreground, everything here was around 20 seconds. So you can see it pretty good. I mean, I'm not a Milky Way shooter and I know that would be a lot harder to do because then you really don't see anything except the sky. And you only have to hope that you got the foreground and focus. But in all the cases where I've been out shooting the night sky, it's late blue hour, something like that. I can still see everything. We'll find out. What's that? We'll find out someday. We'll find out. Yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Uh, yeah, Carl, could you go, uh, go to uh, image number 11? Yeah. Yep. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. I, I was about to say that that's one of my favorites from you as well. So oh, uh, I, I just wanted to know the process of getting this image and like this does not look anywhere close to the conventional uh, compositions that you get to see. Like the the leading line starts from the middle of the frame, and also the treatment in your night images it looks like uh, you would prefer a little bit of Moonlight. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, right? So, so yeah. if I'm if I'm not wrong, rather than going for a completely right. dark sky. Yeah. So, uh, like, could you take us through this image? Like, yeah. Take us through this image. Yeah. Yeah. This was um shot in Iceland. Um, I was there with my friend Alex. We we're on a photo trip. We wanted to go shoot the Bureau Foss. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. Um. That's the Bureau Foss in Iceland. Yeah, yeah, Bureau Foss. Yeah. My friend had never never been there, and we wanted to shoot. <laughs> I I wasn't so keen on going back in there shooting, but I thought maybe with uh with the snow and I could do something different. Maybe zoom in tight in the waterfall and get some cool water action. But unfortunately, we couldn't make it. The snow was super high this year. You can see it here in the background. And this path that normally goes along the river was completely snowed in and have been there before. You got to really watch out. There's a lot of rocks and you take the right. wrong step, you're going to fall into the, uh, the river here. My friend was a little bit disappointed. 
and he left. We had a farm hotel, maybe three, four kilometers up the road and he took off and I decided to stay and ended up getting this shot. What had happened is that night, it, temperatures dropped so cold, I think maybe minus 16, 17, and the water here was pretty warm and I got all of this mist coming off the water and I just kept shooting and shooting this mist. Right. And of course with the focus point of the background here in the mountain, I kept changing my location along the snow, making sure to go in and out and not leave any footprints. But this is the one I came, came up with at the end that I liked the best. Awesome. This is Thanks. Such, such, a, such a simple image. And the way you have uh, processed it, it looks like you are actually standing there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's something I try to always, a big goal of mine. I want the viewer to feel like they're standing there, that they can be, that they're in the photo. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a bit of a fan of not completely dark skies, but I like a little bit of moonlight on my shots. So okay. this, this is amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and here's that star again. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It just gives it something little to pop. Well, it offers an anchor point in the sky. Yeah, yeah, that's how I see it. And I always pick out the brightest star that I find and pop that in there. This is also here, the moon coming up in the side of the image, and that's what created this light flow on the snow. Then I just emphasize that with a little bit of light painting and dodge and burn. And, but this photo was not so much post-processing as sometimes I would do. This is very simple. I kept it simple because it, it felt so clean. It works. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, you, know, you. Um, you know, looking at your images, we've oh, right. <laughs> seen a lot of images of late uh, for obvious reasons. And otherwise also a lot of images come crossing our eyes uh, they look good up to an up to a point and and then at times uh, they start um, becoming an eyesore as well um, but your images when when i particularly look at it the, the the thought first thought comes to my mind is that you can look at these images for hours altogether and and uh, you will not, go, not get bored. You will not want to look away from them. They are so soothing to your eyes, even when you are showing those uh, um, glow in the sky, that golden glow in the sky, still with the dark mood. Um, even those kinds of images, you can just look at them for hours and, and they are very soothing to your soul and eyes and, and uh, senses. I think that is one beautiful part about your images. Your photography. It's an amazing compliment. Yeah. For me, um, I'm kind of my own worst enemy. I, I post photos, I like them, and then after a while, I don't like them anymore. So to hear that coming from you is a big thank you. I think I think uh, what you just said that uh, uh, is is a trait of a photographer who keeps a, a, a growing exponentially because the the faster you fall out of love with your previous image the faster you would want to create a new image. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, exactly. I think that's something. And, and that yeah, and I, I think it is, it is very important for a landscape photographer to get divorced to the previous image as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so true. Totally. Oh, let's see if I have anything else. Okay. Can, you, can you tell us a few uh, stories about the tough times that you had on the field? Tough times? Yep. Um, this was tough. We had hiked back to this place. There are still day hours. I think the sun at this time went down around 4 p.m. We were probably here about 3 p.m. Or no, maybe around 2 p.m. We stayed at this location for so long and the temperatures were minus 20. This was the coldest I've ever had experience in Iceland this winter. And that was also the cause that there was so much snow. That was a tough time, battling out the cold. I didn't want to hike back and miss the shot and give up. You know, I couldn't feel my fingers anymore. My feet were okay, but the fingers really hurt because I kept taking off my gloves. 
that was tough. Um, what else? Yeah, I mean, most of the time I'm actually enjoying everything. It's not. I know a lot of landscape photographers always have this dramatic story. I was out in the mountains and there was a grizzly bear behind me and I'm trying to trying to bite my leg, but I still pulled off the shot kind of thing. So yeah, this this was also one that was a tough shot because of the hike. That was probably about three, four hours up to this point. This was in Austria. That was stressful. But other than that, yeah, I mean, I, I go to places where I'm just hiking and enjoying the time. It is amazing that everything is so beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this was uh, it's also one of my favorites. It's also monochromatic to a point. This was actually in the afternoon I shot this. There's some really nice stormy clouds coming in and we got the sun up here hitting these peaks and the snow. And I tend to like single focus points a lot of times for the foreground as with this shot or with this shot, try to keep it more simple. Or this shot also the single focus in the foreground. Oh. There's another one of my favorite shots. This is actually from right behind where I live. You call it Johnny Appleseed. Yeah, I think someone planted these. I didn't plant them, but it got me thinking that it's a good idea to find a nice composition, go out and plant some flowers and come back next year. I was hiking through the woods behind my house and there was open fields outside the woods and came across this these tulips in this composition. And I just stayed there, waited for the light shot this uh i continued to go back this a couple of years ago but these flowers are gone i don't know if they were ate by wildlife but they don't exist anymore i have to go back and replant them is it sunrise or sunset this is sunset yeah. Uh, uh, one of my other favorites from you is a little bit cliche composition. Um, it's called White Noise, right? White uh, Noise, yeah. I think I have that on here, yeah. But the way you delivered it is it's amazing. Carl, this yeah. is just amazing. I think this is the most unique view of Sk Skoga Falls that I've seen. Uh, but uh, when, when did you click this? I shot this. I believe 2017 or 2018. I'm, I'm I think that was uh, this spot. This um, spot, I think, now is closed to, to to go there. Yeah, and it was due to yeah tourists, tourists and all. Because I think that was 2017, 18 was the year when they started uh, blocking it. Um, okay. uh, so yeah, 2016 we shot this one. One of one no, of but, but, but uh, Prakash, I was not there with you. No, 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 no. Before that, before, before that. that, before that. And this location is I I've, I've been dying to go to this spot and shoot it from there. And uh, this is one hell of a shot. Thank you so much. Yeah, it can be that this was in the 2016 in the, maybe in yeah, the fall. After that, they started barricading that area, and they, they are not because this is dangerous here. I think one Indian movie song was shot at this particular spot and that after that it became so viral with Indians that they started stomping the areas in this spot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now they basically barricaded it. That's yeah, it. Barricaded. But people still go, but uh, that place is very slippery now. Okay. Yeah, Indian movies are uh, like notorious for spoiling places. Like look, this at look, look at Ladakh now. Yeah. This so, we can truly say that this is your signature. This is your signature shot because uh, it's very difficult to call um, any shot from the iconic location as your own shot because millions of people would have shot the same way. Uh, it's very difficult to create a unique composition. Yeah, I mean, this, this is uh, unique. Thank you so much. I'm, I always wanted to get a shot of this, and this is 
I would never shoot this spot again. I don't like doing these iconic locations anymore. But this is one of my favorites. And yeah, I got lucky with it. it was storm light again, one of my favorite types of light to shoot in. And I actually shot this handheld without a uh, tripod. And I tried my, this is two, two shots, the original shot and then another shot that I blended in here along the water with this long exposure effect. That turned out okay, but the rest of the shot was a little blurry because I shot it handheld and it was a little bit shaking up there. So I blended these two together. Okay. Amazing. Yeah, thanks so much. I think what, what, another reason I love our shots is that he covers so many waterfalls. Um, and I think Himadri and I probably have a big, big soft corner for waterfalls. Yes. Yeah, we do. So that's one more reason we like your shots. So Thank much. you so much. Yeah, I love, I love shooting water, waterfalls or moving water, let it be just a lake. You always get something different. Playing around with the shutter speed and exposure time. It's just, I love waterfalls. I love water, shooting water in general. And I'd like I to also, invite I you also to... also like waterfalls, but the big ones, not the small ones. The big ones, yeah. <laughs> Which has more, more, more drama on it. He pretty much likes everything big. And which is the reason he likes it. Because the waterfalls here are smaller. <laughs> no, we, we have some uh, pretty big waterfalls in Meghalaya. So Prakash used to come here. And also Carl. Like uh, the, the place where I live, like it is just two hours away. And uh, like uh, you get the heaviest and the maximum rainfall. It is called Cherapunji. In the world. Yeah, the highest rainfall in the world. Oh, wow. So it is like, uh, it has thousands of waterfalls. And we have just discovered only a couple of them. So oh, wow. you'll, you'll have a, you, I'm sure you'll have the time of your life. Out. I have to come visit you guys. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So you are invited. You, you. and anyone else. Who wants, wants so to much. come over? We'll yeah. take you up on that. Definitely, would love to see India. I, I I think Carl. I don't know if you have this shot. Uh, if I remember it, uh, it was a it was a bush in the winter bush. Uh, the wisping. I don't know if. Ah, uh, the wisping. Yeah, I don't think I. I put it on here. You have it on your site. Yeah, it's on my site. I think it's also my personal favorites. I would try to open it up here, but I'd have a little bit of computer lag. Okay, so maybe you you know you have to close, stop sharing, open your site, and then reshare. That's what you need to do. So, or I can check out here directly in Lightroom if I have if I can import it. Your castle series is my favorite, you know. A castle images? Thank you so much. Yeah, exactly my kind of mood. Uh -huh. Oh, stick with me there, guys. My computer is okay. This one, Sam? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks. This is also um, exactly where I took that other shot with the, the fog. Um, let me go back here. That was taken here. This is just the other side of the river. And this is a little earlier in the day or in the evening, and I shot that. Crazy, this is. This is the processed one, right? This is the process, yeah. I, I would really like to see how is the original one, how the color temperature was. The is color it temperature was a little more warm. I pushed this cold maybe a slight hint of magenta on this and then desaturated it here yeah it was cold 
it's in the evening, blue hour. But here is a little more warm. I didn't like the warmth of this shot. I tend to go more cold lately. The cold tones are very interesting to me. I really love how the you know the branches that little little dark branches are coming out from the white. It's really really interesting. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I went back in and just painted a little bit of that black back in, but I um, lost a lot okay. of that uh, in the process. So I wanted to bring that back in. That that looks that really stands out the whole image. Yeah, thank you so much. I didn't know if it's going to work, but I ended up really loving the shot after. This this is awesome. If if I want to print something, I'll be printing something like this. Seriously. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. How much time did you put in, Carl? Uh, into this shot? Do you know? This shot? Oh, <laughs> I had, I don't remember anymore. Sometimes, I mean, I can. It depends on the photos. It's, I can't remember here, but I put just a couple hours. Sometimes. I work on them for over a week where I come home after work and just sit down for maybe half hour, do a little bit here, a little bit there, and then sit on the photo. It takes me a week, couple of weeks sometimes. I'm very finicky about that. I'm never, I'm unsure of myself. If, if it looks good enough or should I do something more or have I gone too far? So I tend to sit on my shots lately. Yeah, no, that's a very important lesson for all of us and anybody watching, right? So. When it comes to art, you cannot hurry into the final output. It has to be slow and steady. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So, here yeah, now we got some castle shots. <laughs> wow. Oh. You like that one? That's can absolutely wrong. Can I borrow your hard disk? What that? <laughs> can I borrow your hard disk? <laughs> Just for a day. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is yeah, uh, this is really this is a movie poster, hundred percent. Yes. Thank you so much. And this, is, go this, ahead. this this is straight out of Frozen, right? Exactly. Exactly. And this is I mean, New Schoenstein is the logo. Like Disney's logo is New Schoenstein. So, yeah. you know, the irony of that. <laughs> yeah. Carl, next year I'm coming in winter. You can stay with me. We're going out shooting, man. I am coming. Oh, that's great. I am definitely there in April 2021. <laughs> oh, welcome. <laughs> we have to get a bigger house for everybody to come. <laughs> guys we, more we will stay inside the castle. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> we can try. We so is, a, is, is that a, a long hike uh, to get up to this place? To get I've never been here. Yeah, um, you start down below this town, um, Hohenschwangau. It's over here, and then you have to hike up here. Probably about 45 minutes. Get up okay. here, get it on a bridge behind the castle. And you can right, Carl? You can the hike. So, you can, drive. you can drive as well, right, Carl? Uh, yeah, you can drive, yeah. Um, and in Germany, there must be horses, right? Horses? Yeah, there's actually horses at this castle. You can pay them and they'll bring you up here to the castle and you can, a lot of people do it. I'm not so into that, but you can. Horse card. Horse card. <laughs> <laughs> like the old times, you know, Sherlock Holmes and all. Sherlock Holmes? Yeah, they Sherlock. used to move in the Sherlock horse, horse card. Okay, no, I don't know. No. Oh. In the 18, 1800s. 18, okay. No, but yeah, when you come here, you get your fill of horses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's another one of my early shots. These shots are all around 2015 when I first started out and I only shot castles. There's a lot of cityscapes. I like that. The fog was amazing. Funny thing about this shot and this shot, they were taken on the same morning. I was so disappointed when I went back home. I expected I'd have this amazing sunrise. I was so into the sunrise colors and I wasn't interested in the fog or the atmosphere. And I was so just, just mad. I spent so much time getting here and so early in the morning. And then when I first, first started to play with the shots, 
I seen that there was potential there. And that's when uh, I got this love for the fog and atmospherical build or atmospherical pictures. Yep, same there with that one. Um, everything is so. I have seen many images at night from here. From here, but, yeah. Yeah, but you haven't shot them at night. Any reason? No, I haven't shot them at night. Um, the one, yeah, these are shots in 2015. This this castle at that time wasn't so shot, and then it became really popular on Instagram and 500 pics at the time and. I seen a lot of these shots and it just looked too cliche for me. And I guess I didn't, it would be nice to get a nice Milky Way shot, but. Exactly. This, this is, this calls for that. You know, yeah. nice shot with Milky Way or stars full of nice stars. One, yeah. Uh, but no, I, I never got a shot. I just, somehow I lost my interest in shooting the castles. Oh, no, no. Hold it till next year. We are coming after that. You can lose interest. Nice home. You have a blast. Show you guys around. Perfect. Awesome. Oh. This is another castle is not too far from me. Um Castle Hohenzollern. This is an awesome castle. You really you got your peace when you're out here shooting this castle. There's not so many tourists. There's only a couple people up here that know where this path is to get the shot. Oh, probably a lot more now since Instagram, but it's a beautiful place. And again, Castle Elst. I like the shot. I don't like this work that was being done on the castle itself. I tried to take that out. And after a couple hours, I just gave up. It just didn't look right. So I just left it in there. This castle is really photogenic. Yeah, this castle is probably my favorite. A lot of people really love the castle in Schwanstein, but this castle is in the middle of the woods. You can drive to it, and then you got to walk maybe about 10 to 15 minutes, but it's it's not in the city. There's no one else around. And when you get out there early in the morning, wait for the sun to rise to try to catch some fog. It's a really yeah, creepy, creepy experience. I was really scared the first time I shot this. I was alone with a <laughs> plastic flashlight. I didn't have a headlamp and I was shaking in my knees. I was like, oh man. <laughs> the night before you should see the any Dracula movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the biggest uh, the the bigger fear is uh, boars. There are wild boars in these forests. That is that is a big, bigger worry. What's in Draculas? Wild boars. <laughs> yes, yes, it's wild boars. Yeah, in Germany, yeah wild boars. Yeah, that is more of a worry than uh, Draculas. I, I'm more scared of Dracula. I think I'd rather fight with the pig than with Dracula. But they're all <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> there, there is this uh, castle. This is on uh, the Mosul River. It's, um, I think Rhineland Falls is the name of the state. It's middle of the woods. I can't tell you the name of a town that's close by because it's kind of away from everything. For me, where I live, it's about two hour drive on the Mosul River. Okay. So, yeah, I think that was most of my shots here, guys. Unless you guys wanted to see something else. This also I saw on uh, One X. It was popular. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this did well on One X. This was a, a shot where I got lucky. I mean, I was just driving over one side of the peninsula to the other in Iceland and seeing this crazy storm light coming through. And jumped out and shot that handheld. Carl, how much edit goes? Can you can you go back to the previous shot? Yep. How much edit goes into this kind of shots? Do you light paint the mood or the light? Or do you only play with the, what is existing? I was I only played what was existing, but I did some light painting here. I also did some glamour glow to add some atmosphere <clears throat> here where the light was coming through. And then I just went in with a small brush and I emphasize a little bit here where that light was lost, but was falling on and painted in here a little bit light. I, this shot is actually 
very minimal work for what I do. I didn't do so much to it because it was beautiful. I also painted in a little light here on the foreground for yeah, what the foreground is, just to make it stand out from where the light was coming in. A little more contrast here, a little more light and a little more blurry effect back here with the atmosphere. So do you do it with dodge, dodge and burn or with color dodge? Dodge and burn and color dodge both. Uh, it depends on the shot or what I want to accomplish. I work both. Nice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's another shot that I yeah. took early on. I wouldn't go back there, I guess. It's too overshot now, but it's an amazing waterfall. Yeah, we fail to go there every time. You failed? Did you guys try walking or? No, no. Every time we got short of time. Went out we time? Planned, but, yeah, short of time. We Every time we planned, but somehow we didn't manage. I heard now. Or actually, it was imagine there. five five years in a row we didn't manage. <laughs> you, you gotta you gotta get there. It's a hard hike to get back to it, but it's worth it. I think it's worth it. Next time we we have to skip everything else and be there. <laughs> yeah, definitely, I can send you guys a link to the hotel that's by there, so you guys can pretty much hike to it from the hotel. Nice. Uh, Carl. Yeah. Uh, would you uh, would you like to show us in any of these images? Would you like to show us a bit of your processing workflow? Like, what? How do you how do you uh, process your image? A little bit of something. Yeah. Hold on. If, if if it is already existing, like any of the PSDs or something like that. I was actually working on a an old castle shot to show you guys here. Um. Can you guys see that? Photoshop? No, we still see your Lightroom. Okay. So maybe you can you can stop share and reshare. You see that? No. We still see Godafoss. So you can you can stop share and and again reshare with that. Okay. You guys see it? Mm. No. No. You see a blank screen. Yeah. Blank gray screen. Yeah. yeah. Now we see it. You see it? Okay. Yeah. So oh, that's a perfect one to show. <laughs> Prakash will be the happiest. Sorry? Prakash I think all of us. Happiest. I think all of us here, Madri. No, we are, but the excitement <laughs> that Prakash has towards castles. I, no, I, I have the same the same excitement for dark moody oh, images. Okay. Oh, Carl knows it very well. <laughs> yeah, so here's a shot from, uh, once again, Castle Elts. This was on another trip. And I had some fog, but it wasn't what I wanted. I, I kind of built the fog around... Um, Go to the original here. Yeah, my computer is very slow. Here's the original shot. Okay. And here, what I did, I, just using levels and curves and then just painting back into the, round the castle, the atmosphere. You can see here on the sides. Yeah, it's really slow. Sorry about the lag time here, guys. Yeah, so you can see there what I did. I, I brought back in this atmosphere. I mean, there was a lot of fog, a lot of atmosphere going on. I shot that around 20 seconds. And you don't see it anymore in the raw. It was there, not probably to this extreme, but I just tried to bring that back. And 
all I did with this shot was I, I took down the color saturation and this grass, I kind of changed and shift it with selective color. I'll show you guys here more details, but my computer's really here slow. Yeah, there, you can see with this selective color, I push the greens more towards the yellow. And then I play with curves in every single color channel, blue, green, red. I use that for my highlights to get the my color of blue to where I want it at that stage in the photo. And then, yeah, I just continue to paint a little more fog in. And that's way too much. And I worked it back out and got it to this point. Hmm. I wish I could go in here and show you every little thing. No, oh, that's totally fine. But it's, yeah. I don't know, it's kind of sped up a little bit. Here you can see where I brought this atmosphere back in. Here's where I added some texture into the clouds. All I did was select a color that looks like a neutral color. I actually sampled up here and then I just started to paint just to get a little more texture that I have here on my end shot. I also did then some light painting here to create the effect of the light. I did a lot of work on this shot. Normally I don't do so much. I just wanted to use this as an example of what you can do by adding atmosphere into your shots and creating this more drama. That's something I really love lately more than colors, sunsets. I love atmosphere. And I don't do this to all my images, but I like the shot and thought it worked nice. Yeah, that's a, that's a drastic change actually. It looks awesome. Thank you. Just amazing, just amazing. Yeah, there to there. <laughs> All right, Carlos. Any more questions for this on this, guys? I can go into more details if you like. But we'll wait for the tutorial, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we we gladly wait for the tutorial. Yes. <laughs> you guys can Skype me. I probably have better running time on Skype. We can do one there. Okay. Yeah, that, that's yeah. a good idea. That's a good that idea. That will be fun. That will be fun. Okay, okay, let's do it after this session. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you guys liked it. Yeah. This is cool. Amazing, amazing. This is this is one classic example how how you really create atmosphere where it needs to be done and from where you want to remove it and, and then really bring the focus onto what you want to show and um, and yet very very subtle and and th there is no kind of drastically the drastic changes are there but uh, everything still looks very smooth very natural uh, very soothing Thank you. i think jesse you want to say there is no digital art this is just beautiful editing thank you yeah. so much yeah anyway yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah perfect exactly. Yeah. This yeah. is this is the, the, the beauty, the way you are actually showcasing uh, so beautiful castle in a in a most subtle manner, I think. Uh, the way you are doing it. It's amazing. Yeah. It's very yep. hard to do to paint this back in or to create this effect. It's it takes some time to learn it, but it's just very subtle. <clears throat> I mean this shot was also very overexposed. I tend to shoot to the right. I wish most likely we we'll want to bring back down the exposure. And when you shoot to the right, it allows so much more light into your sensor. So when I was standing here, I shot that. It wasn't this bright outside. It was more dark, but yeah, not so moody as I made it here, but it was a lot darker than you've seen that. And when you shoot to the right, then you have the opportunity to bring back down the shot and work back in the atmosphere if it was lost with long exposure. Stunning. Yeah, so yeah absolutely stunning. Uh, there was a question on YouTube uh, by Rajan. He, he's asking, do you typically look or uh, you know scout for these kind of conditions, atmospheric conditions, maybe early in the morning? Yes, definitely. I'm a 
I'm a morning shooter. I do sunset also, but I love early mornings. And yeah, I'm a big weather junkie. I check all the weather apps. And if it looks like it's potentially I could have these conditions, it doesn't matter where I'm at. If I'm just sitting at home and I know tomorrow before I have to go to work or something, it's going to be amazing fog. Then I'm going to go out. I'm always checking that out. So I'm always scouting or if I'm planning a trip to a certain location and I see that the weather is going to be blue skies and clear the entire time, I, I'm going to let it go. When I see storms or it could be fog, I'm there. I definitely like that. It's very similar to one of our other friends who came, Federico Antonio. Uh, I, I don't know if you know him. Federico Antonello, do you know him? No, he, no. He's from uh, the Dolomites, so he does the same thing. Wakes up, checks the weather, and then just runs. He sees fox, and then he runs, right? Yeah, so, awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's, it makes the best. It makes the yeah, the atmosphere, the storm, the, the fog. That's what that's what I love to shoot now. Now, um, I have a question um, in my mind. Uh, it, it's very, very apparent, and it's very... Um, Right there, it's visible through your work that you have a very deep connection with, with nature and surrounding areas, uh, the landscape and all. Um, I think that is what has really created that spark in you to do uh, start getting into landscape photography. Um, <coughs> what, what is important to you? Do you think that it is important to first fall in love with uh, the nature uh, that is important or you are, you are continuously looking at nature uh, with terms of uh, the results, the final result as a landscape image? Um, it is more important to fall in love with the nature for it first. I mean, when I'm out in nature, I'm not definitely there with the, the mindset I have to get a photo. I love spending time in nature and just that one-on-one -on -one action, action with me in the nature, that's something I love. When I was a child, I spent a lot of time in the forest, in the woods. I've always been an outdoors type of person. And photography gives me that, that reason to get out there. And it doesn't matter if I don't get a shot. It's that point of being out in the nature. It makes me feel like a kid again, exploring something new and finding something that I've never seen before. And it's definitely, it's about nature. All right, that's a wonderful answer. And, and um, again, an extension of this is that uh, you have created some wonderful castle images. You've created some wonderful mountain, mountainscapes and all. Um, what is that keeps you motivating to go out and create more and create new, continue creating? Um, even if it is the same place or maybe to a new, new spot? Oh, for me, it's it's a determination to push myself more and try new and more challenging things. I want to kind of expand myself. I've been trying a lot harder lately to shoot directly in the forest. As Solomon, we all said earlier, how hard these shots are to get. That's something that pushes me. I, I want to get these shots without having the fog, without having that, and get an amazing composition. I always want to look to push myself. And also, I just love being outdoors. And I always have my camera with me. and. Sometimes I don't even need a reason or kind of um, kind of push. I just want to get out, be in nature, and when I see something that's interesting to me, then I have an opportunity and take a shot. See if it works. A lot of times it doesn't, but it's about the time that I spend outside in nature. Okay. And how much how much uh, are you fond of using your tripod in creating these images? Tripod. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I'm shooting early in the morning like this, I'm pretty much always on the tripod. Okay. A lot of my four shots, a lot of them are handheld. I've been trying lately to work more without the tripod to push up my ISO and push up my creativity a little bit more. But I, I shoot a lot on my tripod. Okay. Has, have you ever found that you... you you carried, you lugged your tripod all the way up and, and uh, reached the spot and then you realize that, no, you you shouldn't have bought it. You shouldn't have uh, worked so hard and and uh, handheld was enough. 
Yep, this has happened to me many a times. Or sometimes I'm lugging the tripod to a spot for hours hiking and I don't even take my camera out of the bag. And I'm like, why did I even take the tripod? And you know, it's not the lightest of tripods, but that happens a lot. Uh, but I always just consider that if I have it with me and I do need it, yeah, then I have it. If I don't have it and I really need it, uh, tough. <laughs> <laughs> Good, good. Yeah. There is, I think, one more question on uh, it is this exposure of the and and so Rajan is asking on YouTube. So how do you do this scouting? What is your workflow like? Uh, the apps and um, what is your most important app that that you really um, are fond of when you are trying to do this uh, weather scouting or something? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I use the local weather apps here in Germany, uh, weather.de. I mean, that's just for here. But I also use an app called Sun Surveyor, and that shows um, exactly, yeah, where you're at, the, the sunrise, the sunset, the blue hour. If there's a possibility for the Milky Way. It's a pretty interesting app. And pretty much those two. All right, all right. That's okay. So, any, anybody wants to ask any questions? Because um, I might have a uh, couple of questions. Let's, let me see. Mm. Okay, now um, I was I was going through your Instagram and and uh, um, you. I think your first image that you posted on your Instagram was in 2016, if I remember it right. Yeah. You know, very, very few images that you have posted over a period of time. And uh, um, kind of, um, so I'm sure that you would have clicked many more images uh, than you have posted. Uh, but you are very selective. Um, so are, are you selective in clicking or are you selective in processing or are you selective in uh, posting, sharing it on social media? Uh, what is the, uh, what, 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 what's happening there? Because so many, so, so few images that are there on your Instagram in particular that I was looking at. Yeah, I think I'm, uh, I'm my own worst enemy. Like I said, I'm very, it's hard to please myself and I'm very, with my processing, I, I only want to try to portray the best of my, my work. And that's the reason I don't post so often. I rather try to take time and try to give it my best and to post something really quick just for likes. It's more than, more than that for me. I want to post the, something that I was connected to where I, I had a true connection of feeling with it. And those are the shots then that I'll post. I shoot a lot more than I post. That's that's for sure. I mean, I came back from Iceland a couple times with over five thousand photos, and only posted a couple. But I'm yeah, I'm very selective, and I guess it's too picky on my my own part. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, but what is your thought about the social media? How do, how do you treat it in your mind and in your life? Um, how important it is. It's not that important. I mean, I, I like social media. I really enjoy seeing the works of others. And without that, that wouldn't be available. So I'm very happy about that. But, you know, it's, it's not all it's cracked up to be. There's a lot of guys out there that are struggling to get a couple of likes and have major images. And then there's people that are posting shots 50 a day and have a million followers, you know. And But definitely enjoy a lot of stuff I see and I enjoy discovering and seeing new photographers or seeing something that truly inspired me that gets me to go out and I think wow what an image and for that reason I find it good for the stuff with the hashtagging with um once beautiful places being destroyed from the tourists that's a negative thing okay but uh Right now, um, because many people say that uh, they, social media is a necessary evil because uh, it helps them make money as well. So probably tomorrow, somewhere down the line, when you start 
bringing out these videos, you would also be looking at um, buyers who are interested in buying your um, videos and, and maybe even workshops. Um, and that is where social media follower base somehow sometimes comes in handy. So, yeah, of course. Never, pardon? Yeah, of course. That's a very, that's a big plus. And of course, it's a great way to expand yourself and to get discovered or to promote a, a new tutorial or, yeah, that's a, a very positive. Yeah, yeah. So, so because the kind of, um, we, at, at a panel, we really have um, the kind of uh, one agreement, uh, understanding that your kind of work that you produce is far more superior than people uh, who have large follower base. Um, so, um, and, and somehow both do not match. Does it ever bother you? Yeah. To be honest, sometimes it bothers me. It started to bother me a lot more, but I don't consider my work better than other people's. That's, it just. No, it definitely me. is. What's that? It definitely is like uh, oh, better yeah. than most of them out there. Like, but you know, sometimes you'll see a, a photo and you just know it's just horrible. And <laughs> not all the time, but and they're getting so many thousands of likes. And it, yeah, it kind of makes me think, man, I just put in two weeks working on this one photo and I got a couple likes, but I got over that. Oh, well. I, somebody I somebody said, said over here, social media is anti-social. Yeah. What? And also, I was, Prakash, I was about to say this. So <laughs> if social media is not working for you. I think we will have to make it anti-social. Probably that will work for you. Anti-social media, it sounds good. <laughs> because it is, it is so strange and, and, uh, um, some, sometimes what, what's happening out there does not justify. And uh, you, it doesn't make sense at all at times. Yeah, that's true. Yep, I don't understand it. But I'm not going to let that discontinue or make me discontinue my work. Um, obviously, obviously. Yeah. And I think that is a mark of a good uh, uh, artist because um, you're creating first for your own satisfaction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, then you throw it out for everybody else to see it and admire or junk it, whatever, whatever. It's up yep. to them. And the main thing is good work, they last much longer than this shortly likes and comments and very nice, wow, this, that. Because they will always jump around a lot of people and whatever images they see, it goes on. But when you have a good work and good base, it goes much longer than all these images. Right. Yes, right on. I feel the exact same. Quality speaks a lot better than quality. Exactly. Yep. So any, any new challenges that you are uh, planning for? New any new challenges? Like we, we haven't seen uh, much. Or I don't think so. I have seen any uh, images from the deserts, like sand dunes or something like oh, that. Yeah. That's yeah. what the big goals are. Really Germany proud. doesn't have sand dunes, right? No sand dunes in Germany. No, of course not. Of course. Not. <laughs> fly yeah. out of here. Any any challenges that you are uh, planning for the times ahead? Yeah, the, the deserts. That's a big one for me. I'd like to go to, yeah, maybe Death Valley. I've never been there, or maybe in come the to Dubai. Come to Dubai. I will show you much better sand dunes. Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> I'm there. We have la world's largest sand dunes. Which is uh, the empty quarter. Okay. Have you so shot? it's massive. It's called empty quarter. Empty quarter. It's massive. Yeah, empty quarter. Have you shot it? Have you shot it yourself? Ah uh, no, it needs a uh, four by four, and uh, it need, you need to go in much more. We have shot nearby areas, but okay. not inside. Oh, I have to check this out when we get off here. Yeah. Oh, would love to see that. But never got the desire to shoot uh, seascapes? I've done a little bit of seascapes. I like seascapes. Don't get me wrong. Um, yeah, it's just not so... My heart's not there. I love seascapes. My heart's not into it like that. I, I like the forest. I like the mountains. and That's where I feel more comfortable shooting. And waterfalls. Anybody <laughs> see 
inspiration from Carl now? Like somebody who inspires you? New work that inspires me? Yes. Uh, any photographer who inspires you? A list yeah. of photographers. Yeah. Yeah, all the greats, of course. But uh, there's a couple of guys that I don't think they have so much recognition. They deserve a lot more. Um, Christos Zumidis. Yes. Yes, he's amazing. Uh, He's amazing, dude. And um, Sharon uh, Crow, he has some amazing work. These guys have their own distinct quality of photos. Yeah, yeah. Chris for a long time. He's he's so understated. He's yeah, so underrated. Yeah. So under Works beautiful. Uh, any any of the American greats like you know? Oh, of course, Alex Noriega, Ted Gore, all those guys. Yeah. I, I saw a little bit of shade of Ted in uh, approach of color theory that mm -hmm. you apply as well because your color palette looks very tight. So okay. is that something that you picked up uh, from Ted or just curious? No, I I didn't learn it directly from him. I've, I've seen his tutorials, but I didn't learn the color theory, but I, I loved how he went about having these colors that kind of work together. And then I started learning about it on my own because I always loved his photos. So it's, yeah, you can kind of see it in my own work because his color palette's amazing. Yes, yes, yes. It uh, looks, I don't know, it just reminded me of 10. Yeah, uh, okay, thank you. I think that's a big, big compliment. It reflects yeah. how good your work is. Thank you so much. Yep. Yeah, those guys inspired me in the chorus. Brian Dyer, Ole Hendrick, Rico of <laughs> Body, you know, these are all the greats. Yeah, it's kind of, an, uh, kind of um, a revelation for all of us here because uh, ever since we started doing this series and uh, um, the kind of images that we are seeing, the kind of uh, work that photographers are producing, it, it's really mind-boggling. Um, now, there, there is one particular thought that, that just crossed my mind. Um, we have this um, bombardment of social media and um, which is becoming a nuisance for all of us. Anyway, it's a necessary evil. We want it uh, uh, for our own use and benefit, uh, but then it, is, it can actually be very nasty as well. And then we are going through the COVID situation as well. Um, uh, travel is restricted. Travel will open uh, completely throughout the world. International borders will eventually open, but we don't know when. Uh, where, because of these two reasons, what do you see in your opinion is uh, the future of a landscape photographer in particular? I see that uh, the landscape photography will be more localized to the land, to the photographer. You're going to see guys starting to shoot more around where they live instead of traveling out wide and about. So when I'm here in Germany, I can, I can shoot the mountains, I can shoot the Alps. So if you live in the West Coast of America, you know, these guys are going to continue just to shoot their own region. It, it's actually a good thing. I mean, you can explore what you have and, yeah. Okay. I, think there is a, I think there is a message for all of us. Yeah. We need to shoot more in India, <laughs> which we don't. Guys don't shoot at all over there? We shoot very little in India. At least I can talk about Jesse and myself and uh, uh, probably Prakash. I think Himadri and Som do a little bit of shooting in India. No, I Som not so much. From India. <laughs> Sandeep, I think Sandeep, uh, the, the, uh, I was having this discussion. Um, so we're trying to take it away from um, uh, Carl for, a, for just for a minute because you brought this up. Uh, and there are viewers who are watching us. Somebody was asking me that why don't people shoot in India? And I think it's not to do with not uh, India not having good locations. It's also no, no, no. with uh, we don't uh, we we are not in love with those locations. I think it's got to do with uh, the logistics at times. Exactly. Uh, the time does uh, it takes and the money that we have to spend to to uh, to be there and also, uh, also the accessibility. I add accessibility as well. So uh, it becomes slightly easy for us to really reach these uh, uh, other um, international locations and create images than actually um, uh, reach to, to Indian locations. I think that is that is my take. Otherwise, on we, we have oh, everything here. We, we have the mountains, we have the waterfalls, we yes, have yes, the seascapes, yes, yes. everything. 
But we, we have the deserts. We, we have, have the deserts. Exactly. But you need everything is in India. But the rainforest. We have the rainforest. Yeah. It's just exactly. the accessibility. Just to shoot exactly. the mountains, I would have to drive ten hours maybe uh, to shoot a clear view of the of the Himalayas. But where can you get such beautiful mountains than Himalayas? But the yeah. ten it hours of it would be a two two, two days, days drive for me. For me, yeah, exactly. Two yeah. days. Yeah. Let's not take it away from Carl now. So, uh, Carl, it's been a phenomenal session. Just, just the fun part. We, uh, with uh, Joshua, we had um, a certain uh, rapid fire. Um, so, um, maybe I'll ask similar questions to you, or maybe I'll just twist certain questions to you, um, and then probably uh, let's let's have some fun. So, okay. for you, uh, though we see from your images, um, so for you, bright or dark. 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 Um, in terms of your own um, uh, persona, bright or dark? Right. <laughs> so try, try to be. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, monochrome or color, colorful? Monochrome. Monochrome. And. Um, Sunrise or sunsets? Sunrise. Sunrise. I think, yeah, I, I think I'm sorry you mentioned that. Um, in terms of astro, um, Milky Ways or only Auroras? Aurora. Milky Way? Aurora. Auroras. Auroras. All right. And um, you are a solo shooter or you love shooting with people? So go shoot a hike. That's worth it. Even if it is hiking? Yeah, a lot of times I go hiking with my friends, but I prefer to be alone to shoot. I shoot with my friends also, but I think some of my favorite images came when I was alone and just had time to myself. I didn't feel any pressure. All right, all right, wonderful. And uh, so just one last uh, question. What is... What is the best thing about being a landscape photographer? And what is one worst thing about being a landscape photographer? Ooh, that's a hard one. <laughs> the best thing is seeing all these amazing places, getting to see that. I mean, if I wasn't into landscape photography, I wouldn't have seen all these amazing places or even known about them, to tell you the truth, because you wouldn't be looking at photos as often as a photographer. And the worst thing? pressure I, for me personally the pressure I put on myself to produce an image I'm very my own worst enemy I'm always too critical for me personally that's the worst thing I always want it to be bigger and better than the next I yeah I think I think that is why uh, if, if you find that to be worse and that is why your images are coming out to be the best because because you are uh, uh, looking to, you're striving hard to really create your next image to be better than your previous image. And I think that speaks volume. And there's a, there's a learning for all of us uh, guys, because um, this approach is the only approach which will take us forward as individuals. That's very true. Yeah, that's, that's true. So um, thank you, Carl. It has been an amazing talk, amazing session. And uh, so, uh, wonderful. So I, I think we will uh, thank you so much for pouring your heart out. Thank you so much for inspiring all of us here and uh, being open to answering all the questions that we put forward. And so just one last, uh, we will take a uh, kind of uh, screenshot. So thumbs up, smile and let us, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, let's stay connected and uh, let's keep inspiring each other. Thank you. Thanks for this Thank you, talk. Carl. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Thank waiting, you. For the, waiting for the tutorials. Yeah. 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 Or, yeah. Or, or the session. Let's talk about or the, the session. session. Yes. We'll catch let's up. talk about the session. We'll catch okay. up. Bye bye. Yeah. Stay in bye -bye. touch. Bye. 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 Okay, guys. Prakash, bhai, kaan chale gaye? Ah, aage. You are still, you are still live.
जैसे स्टॉप स्ट्रीमिंग ऑन यूट्यूब 